Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Fortunately, I'm kind of starting to get my life together here, which is great because it means that I'll be able to post videos a little bit more often. They'll be coming more regularly in about two weeks, though, once I have a little bit more time and I'm back in the U.S. Um, just quick announcement, congrats to Pranav, who hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, was laid off, was able to get another job, um, accredits this channel for some amount of help, though I doubt it because all I do is act like an idiot and blabber about systems design. So uh, congrats to you, Pranav. Congrats on staying in America. And uh, yeah, let's get into today's video, which is about serialization frameworks. All right, so let's quickly go ahead and do this video so I can go and get some food. So basically the premise of the problem is this. I have this field called a person object. As you can see, it has myself, my attractiveness level, and my girlfriend and her attractiveness level. And I want to be able to hold this data on a database. And additionally, you know, it's probably going to be sent from some server to the database. So it'd be nice if uh, you know, we found a good way to go ahead and encode this data somehow and send it from our server to a database. So basically, the traditional way of actually holding this piece of data on a database would be with a SQL or a relational database. So let's imagine we had some table called person. And I'll go ahead and write that down. And then in person, we would have IDs for every single uh, row. We would have the names, the attractiveness, and then a foreign ID, or in this case, it wouldn't be foreign because it's the same table, but another ID that actually points to the person. So in this case, the ID of my girlfriend would be two, and that would be pointing to Corinna Kopp, who I'm obviously dating. So another way of doing this is to actually store the data in a more denormalized fashion, right? Because the issue with the relational model is that uh, if I want to have all of the data in my record accessible in one place, this is not necessarily possible. So in the relational model, you know, you might have multiple tables that are combined in order to fetch one single record. You know, if, uh, for example, I had like um, uh, a YouTube videos table and I had IDs showing that I was the one creating them, I would have to go to the YouTube videos table in order to fetch all of the YouTube videos that I've created. So, for example, now what we have is uh, some other basically ways of storing this data in more of a key value format and the ways that databases might actually do them. So the common ones are going to be things like JSON and XML, right? So these are just plain text formats in ways in which we can effectively store data and look at them and read them. And it makes things pretty simple, right? So the, what I have on the left here is basically JSON where I have some field named person, and then I go ahead using brackets uh, to list out all of the other data that's there. And that's great because they're human readable, but at the same time, uh, these have a lot of issues as well. So even though a lot of us use JSON, for example, in just like making our own web app in a massive company, these are not too feasible. The reasoning being uh, they're less type safe. So JSON, for example, is hard to distinguish between types of numbers, uh, and there's some issues there with XML as well. But more importantly, there's a ton of overhead with JSON and XML. So if you look here, I'm writing out the field person a bunch of times and writing out the word name, attractiveness, girlfriend. And the truth is, if I know that every single row in my database has all of these fields consistently, I don't actually have to write those out. I can store this data in a much more efficient format, thus saving me a ton of space. So why is it good to save us a ton of space? Well, for starters, it means that there's less disk usage that we're going to be having uh, in our company. And also it means if we're sending data from a server over to the database, there's less that actually has to travel over the network. So basically, you know, we want this data locality. And by doing so, we would prefer to use something like a serialization library. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how those work. So the example of serialization libraries that I'm first going to talk about are things like uh, Google's protocol buffers and Apache Thrift. And the way these work are as follows. So we've got basically some sort of message. So a message would just kind of be, think of it as like the row of your database. Um, and in this case, it would be named person. So what we're gonna do here is give every single field in our person message a number. And this is how these things work. So we would say uh, there's some name field that's going to be required and the kind of index of it is number one, or not even the index, but just basically the field tag is what it's called. Then we have our attractiveness field uh, with an int type. Again, this is type safe, which is great. And that's going to be field number two. And then finally, an optional girlfriend field because, well, Karina Koff doesn't have a girlfriend, but I do. So as you can see, what we can now do is when we store these things on disk, it allows us to not have to list out the word person, name, attractiveness, girlfriend every single time. We can literally just keep a mapping from the tag number to the field value. 
So in this case, you know, tag number one means that I am sending uh, the word name is equal to Jordan. So that's very important. It saves us a ton of space, especially because one can be represented in binary as just either a literal one or, you know, say we have uh, four fields in total or three fields here, I can just use um, uh, effectively O1. So again, by effectively just using uh, these kind of small mappings from field tags to field names, we can save a ton of space on disk. In addition to that, these actual files of messages are useful for other programmers. They just act as good documentation. They show the fields off that are in your data, so it's easier to reason about what exactly is in your database or what exactly is being sent over the network. This does come at the cost, of course, of being not human readable, right? So as you can see down here, uh, basically we have to serialize or encode our data using the actual message format itself. And what that means is that uh, in the actual database, the data is not stored as like physical text, but it's stored as a bunch of zeros and ones. And so, you know, we would have to go ahead and deserialize it. So there is some CPU penalty that comes with that. But again, it is oftentimes worth it for the amount of storage that it gets saved. Okay, so one thing that we've covered now is that we do have to have basically some files that uh, list out what the format of our data is. However, that itself kind of leads to some problems because why? Uh, data basically just evolves over time. We're eventually gonna wanna add some fields to this and uh, it wouldn't be acceptable if we weren't able to do that, right? So keep in mind, we had this person message before and we had that name, attractiveness, and girlfriend field and now I wanna go ahead and add some other field called net worth. Right. Well, what I actually have to do is just go ahead and add it as an optional field because we know that any existing rows in the database don't have that net worth field yet. So if we made it required or we made it required without some sort of default value, it would mean that all of our existing rows in the database would be invalid. And if we were to ever read them from the database in our code, we could potentially break our application and cause an error. So by making this thing optional or making it nullable, it means that our code is actually going to be forwards compatible, which is great. And by definition, all of this stuff is also backwards compatible because say I have a piece of code that reads from the database and you know it doesn't expect the net worth field to be there, but there is a net worth field in the data, it will just ignore that field and operate as per usual. So again, uh, this is really great, but even still, protocol buffers and thrift do have some disadvantages. I keep mentioning that they basically require a file on the part of the coder to go ahead and write out the data schema. So what that means is that you as the programmer has to know about the schema of the data at compile time. But there are some points in life where this isn't always possible. Imagine that you have some sort of database and you've got a server A and a server B and they keep publishing rows to the database and those just change over time. They could even be rows from like an external company or someone else and you're basically just ingesting them into your data warehouse or data lake or whatever it may be, or Hadoop or anything like that. And you don't even know what the format's gonna be, but you wanna make sure that once you do have all of those rows of data, that you are compressing them as necessary. So let's imagine now again that server A is publishing a thousand rows and server B is publishing 2000 rows. Well, we actually just wanna be able to create data schemas for those on the fly. And that is kind of what this framework Apache Avro does. So Avro is very similar to thrift and protocol buffers, with the exception that instead of giving all those fields unique tags or numbers, what it does is it basically just creates a schema based off of the names of all the columns. And it does this in a way that is very smart, and we'll cover that in a second. So basically from server A, we can create an Avro schema called uh, version A.00, and then from server B, we can do the same thing with version B.00, which is great. So let's go ahead and continue this example because it's not so simple, right? Even if we give all of these a thousand rows an extra field that basically says here's the Avro version, right? A.00, and then we know how to read it in the database. There are often gonna be times where say, I want to be able to read the data on server B that I published from server A. And server B doesn't actually have access to the format of the data in advance. So in this case, Avro is actually able to perform some cool things for us. So let's imagine we have some Avro schema database, right? And we'll hold this on our database. It's useful for the database to actually decode the data because we need to be able to have all the schemas in order to read the data. And we've got our A.00 and our B.00 formats. So you can see that the difference between them is that they both have the field name, but net worth is in an A and net worth is not in B. Sorry for my ridiculous check mark there. 
So what we can actually do is we can call A basically the writer schema and we can call B the reader schema because we want to read data on server B that was written from server A. We'll read from the database. So what can Avro actually do for us? Well, it'll do the following. It'll basically rectify the writer and the reader schema in a smart way. So it'll see that both of these things have the field name and it'll match those, right? So it'll basically say, okay, I know about this field. I'm going to go ahead and read it. It'll look at uh, some field called net worth and it'll say, I've never seen net worth before. I'm just going to ignore it. Well, that's fair enough because that's only in the writer schema, but not in the reader schema. And then finally, we have this field attractiveness. So uh, server B expects some field attractiveness, but it doesn't see it in server A. It's not present. So what we have to do then is make sure to provide all of these columns with a default value. In the case of attractiveness, it's an int, so I imagine it would be zero. And then basically server B would fill that value zero in for attractiveness when reading all of these rows. So that's how Avro would go ahead and rectify kind of the writer versus the reader schema if the reader doesn't have access to the writer schema. Often it should because again, there should be a centralized repository of Avro schemas, right? If we are all writing to Hadoop, then Hadoop should go ahead and store all of those schemas in some separate database so that everyone else has access to them. Uh, but that's not necessarily always a possibility. So again, Avro is a really smart thing. It's super useful when you're doing a ton of data ingestion to be able to kind of update your schema on the fly if you don't know how things are going to be in advance. All right, guys. Well, I hope this video helped. As per usual, um, I'll be back in about a week. And then uh, hopefully once I'm back to Chicago, I can start uh, actually posting videos on a more consistent basis. So looking forward to it, and I will see you guys soon.